Hi, my name is Jamie Simpson, and I'm a recent graduate of the law program here at Dalhousie University. One of my reasons to, for coming to Dal was to participate in the environmental law program here. Um, I had heard it was a, an excellent program, and I knew it would give me a solid base in environmental law. So I took the environmental law courses offered by Drs. Meinhard Duell and David Vanderswag, and I also participated in the environmental clinic, uh, environmental law clinic course offered by MELP. Um, in conjunction with the East Coast Environmental Law Association, which is a nonprofit charitable organization affiliated with MELP. Uh, before coming to law school, I worked as a forester and as an advocate for better forestry practices. Um, I've also written a couple of books about forestry in Eastern Canada, and now I'm working as the executive director of the East Coast Environmental Law Association. Um, and with the association, um, we advocate for better environmental laws, for better enforcement of those environmental laws. And we also evaluate government's performance with respect to their obligations uh, in environmental matters. Uh, we provide citizens and community groups with information and advice about uh, the legal aspects of environmental issues that they face. So check us out at eclaw.ca, that's e-c-e-law.ca. Uh, one of the projects that we're working on is to promote environmental rights in Eastern Canada. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. A few months ago, the David Suzuki Foundation approached us and asked if I would give a presentation on environmental rights um, at an event that they were, that they were putting on. And uh, about a week before, my, before the talk, I, I found myself scratching my head just wondering what the heck I was going to say during my five minutes up on stage. And uh, so not making much progress, I, I <laughs> stepped away from my computer and, and I opted to go for a little hike down by the ocean. And uh, so my friend and I, we, we ambled down towards the, towards the water through these coastal heath barrens that are common around Halifax. Uh, we, were, we took pails with us because we were walking through huckleberry bushes and, and uh, huckleberries were in their prime. And, and uh, if you haven't picked and eaten huckleberries, I'd highly recommend it. Um, so we, we ambled down towards the water. We were picking these huckleberries. And I got thinking um, about all the generations of, of people, of, of kids that have been out in these uh, barrens picking huckleberries and the, and the cranberries that grow closer down to the shore. And, uh, and as I was sampling the huckleberries, uh, slowly filling my pail, but also sampling quite a few, I started thinking about uh, people that eat food um, that they gather or hunt or collect from the land and end up getting sick because, the, because of environmental toxics that are in the, in the food that they're eating. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and they, uh, the toxics accumulate in their own bodies and are sometimes passed on to their children through mother's breast milk. And I thought about people up north, um, Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people whose traditional foods are now laced with toxic contaminants brought in by air and water currents and accumulated in the flesh of the food that they're eating. And this is food from the land, food that you think should be the healthiest food in the world. And I thought about people in various parts of Canada who are sick because of exposure <clears throat> to toxic chemicals in their surrounding water, air, land, and even in the food that they're eating, simply because of where they happen to live. And how can it be, I thought, that we do not have a legal right to live in an environment that does not compromise our health? Yet, that is the state of environmental rights here in Canada. More than 90% of UN member countries recognize their citizens' right to live in a healthy environment, yet Canada, along with the United States, China, Australia, and a few others, is among the small minorities of country that does not recognize this right. As I mentioned, I recently went back to law school and um, not exactly sure what possessed me to, to go back to law school sometime, some sort of midlife crisis perhaps. Um, somebody recently asked me, so what's it like to go to law school? And uh, I said, well, it's kind of like a, a long walk up a steep hill in a cold, driving rain. And uh, you get to the top of the hill and there's, there's no view and you just turn around and, and walk back down again. So um, if you're ever considering going to law school, um, 
And if you enjoy long walks up steep hills in a cold, driving rain, then, then it might be just the thing for you. But anyway, as I worked my way through law school, I came to realize three things in particular about law. Um, first is that we are all embedded in this thing called law. It shapes how we live our lives, how we interact with each other, how we interact with our government, and how the government interacts with us. And when you dig into it, there's hardly an aspect of our lives, of our society, that isn't influenced by law. And second, I learned about human rights. Um, in particular, I realized that the legal recognition of human rights is fairly new in Canada. Not so long ago, for example, there was no legal right uh, against discrimination. My grandmother was 18 in 1940. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the Montreal Forum was within its rights to refuse to serve a man by the name of Mr. Fred Christie. Mr. Christie had ordered a beer for himself and for two friends after watching the Canadiens play a game. The Supreme Court of Canada said that the color of Mr. Christie's skin was reason enough for any business in Canada to deny him service, and it's a decision that seems unfathomable today. It wasn't until the 1970s that Canada and the provinces all had uh, implemented bills of human rights. And it wasn't until 1982 that we had our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And don't get me wrong, we are far from perfect on human rights in Canada. Look to those with little access to justice, with little opportunity to assert their rights. And yet, despite the continu continuing shortcomings, we have come a long way since Mr. Christie's case. Nonetheless, our human rights journey in Canada is far from complete. So long as our legal system does not recognize that a child has a right to live in an environment that doesn't make her sick, our work on human rights remains deficient. There are, indeed, Canadian children and adults whose health is compromised by the air they breathe, the water they drink, and the food that they eat. The World Health Organization reports that an estimated some 36,000 Canadians die prematurely every year due to environmental hazards. Now my third point about what I learned in law school is that I came to learn that law is malleable and that law evolves. It's not static. And it evolves due to pressure from groups of people who care about an issue and know that there's a better way. So we currently do not have environmental rights in Canada, but neither do we have a charter of rights and freedoms a few decades ago. The rights and freedoms we enjoy now, thanks to the charter, show that change is entirely possible. How can we not have a right to breathe clean air? How can we not have a right to drink clean water or to eat food free from harmful contaminants? How can we not have a right to live in a healthy, biodiverse ecosystem? Environmental rights, essentially, recognize that human health and well-being depend on healthy environments. More specifically, environmental rights have both a substantive and a procedural component. The substantive component states the nature of the right. We might state, for example, that every person in Nova Scotia has the right to a healthy environment, including a right to unpolluted air, clean water, and uncontaminated food. The procedural components are often based on three objectives. First, access to information. Second, participation in decision making. And third, access to justice. A right to information is an essential aspect of government transparency and thus citizens' ability to hold governments accountable for their environmental record. A right to information can also include a right to be informed of toxic substances in the environment, in food, and in other consumer products. It can also include a right to be informed on the ongoing health of the environment and changes in the environment by way of State of the Environment reports. Furthermore, the right can ensure that the public is informed of any environmental emergencies. A right to public participation ensures that citizens can participate in a meaningful way in decision-making processes that affect the environment. 
This right builds on the right to information by giving citizens, by giving informed citizens the opportunity to apply their information. Public participation in government decision-making processes should be a fundamental part of any democracy. Procedural environmental rights can also increase citizens' access to justice. This includes a right to challenge the outcomes of decision-making processes that affect the environment. Access to justice can also be improved by ensuring that concerned citizens have standing to challenge decisions. Finally, access to justice can be improved by specifically enabling private prosecutions and civil actions to protect the environment. Other procedural rights that provide access to justice include protection from frivolous lawsuits designed to intimidate and silence citizens and environmental organizations. These suits are sometimes known as slap suits or strategic lawsuits against public participation. Similarly, employees who report environmental problems, sometimes known as whistleblowers, can be protected from unfair punitive actions by their employers. Finally, environmental rights can include a provision for an independent body to oversee the administration of environmental rights within a given jurisdiction. Such a body can adjudicate environmental disputes, oversee compliance with environmental legislation, and provide reports on environmental governance and the implementation of environmental rights. <clears throat> environmental rights were formally recognized for the first time in the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Human Environment, that is the first Earth Summit. Principle one of the Stockholm Declaration that was produced at this conference states, in part, each human has the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. Since 1972, there have been many iterations of this substantive right to live in a healthy environment. Most of the nations that have recognized the environmental rights of their citizens have incorporated the right into their national constitutions, thereby making environmental rights part of the fundamental fabric of the nation's laws. Other, na other, other nations have created environmental rights through legislation at various levels of government within their country. Finally, some nations have environmental rights thanks to court decisions that recognized implicit environmental rights in the nation's already existing legal framework. In Canada, we have some pr procedural environmental rights in some jurisdictions. Ontario passed an Environmental Bill of Rights in 1993, which gives citizens a number of procedural rights but stops short of recognizing a substantive right to live in a healthy environment. Quebec added a right to a healthy environment to its Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms in 2006. The Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut also have passed modest environmental rights legislation, but all fall short of recognizing comprehensive and effective environmental rights for their citizens. A nonprofit environmental law organization in New Brunswick drafted an environmental bill of rights, but which is yet to be championed by a politician. Also in New Brunswick, a coalition of organizations has drafted a bill of rights to protect children's health from environmental hazards, but it too does not yet have a political champion. What will we gain by implementing a constitutionally recognized right to a healthy environment in Canada? Canada currently sits near the bottom of developed industrialized nations in various indices of environmental performance. We have communities without reliable access to safe drinking water. We have communities whose residents are exposed to harmful pollutants. <clears throat> Canada is often the recipient of the Fossil Award at climate change conferences, recognizing our failure to respond to climate change. Nations that have recognized a legal right to a healthy environment for their citizens tend to fare much better in indices of environmental performance. Environmental laws are better enforced. New policies are put through the screen of environmental rights. 
Uh, citizens can participate in environmental decision making. Governments are held accountable for their record on the environment. And successive governments are less able to roll back progress made by previous governments. And this correlation between environmental rights and on-the-ground performance could be coincidental rather than causal. However, as Dr. David Boyd suggests, the consistency of the correlation between constitutional protection for the environment and superior environmental performance provides persuasive, albeit not conclusive, evidence of substantial influence. And some may argue that environmental rights would be ineffective, thus not worth the effort. Such rights may, in reality, be nothing more than paper tigers, vague and ineffective, and thus a waste of time and resources. But the circumstantial evidence from those countries that have implemented a constitutional right to a healthy environment suggests that Canada likely does have much to gain by recognizing environmental rights for its citizens. Achieving constitutional environmental rights in Canada could follow three paths. First, Canada and the provinces could attempt to amend the Constitution. With good reason, Canada's Constitution is extremely difficult to change. It has been amended in the past, um, but it's by no means uh, an easy proposition. Nonetheless, polls indicate that the vast majority of Canadians do support such an amendment, and with the right political leadership, such an amendment could be possible, although it's perhaps a long shot. Secondly, the government could ask the courts, in what is known as a reference case, whether the Constitution implicitly recognizes a right to a healthy environment. Finally, and this is the option I'm going to talk about for a bit, the courts could recognize, through a litigated case, an implicit right to a healthy environment in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, specifically under Section 7, our right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Ecojustice, a charitable law, environmental law organization, is making just such a case in regard to unhealthy air that the people of Sarnia, Ontario, breathe. People who happen to live in Sarnia are exposed to pollutants from 60 chemical, petroleum refining, and petrochemical facilities, all located uh, within 25 kilometers of the city center. And the pollutants in question have been shown to cause cancer, cardiovascular disease, and respiratory illnesses, among others. Disease rates among the residents of Sarnia are higher than in neighboring communities. Now, Ecojustice is arguing, through a judicial review case before the Ontario Superior Court, that two residents, Ms. Ader Lockridge and Mr. Ron Plain, have been made sick by toxic contaminants in their environment and that their Section 7 right has been violated because the government continues to allow these contaminants to be put in their environment. Ecojustice also argues that their client's Section 15.1 right to be free from discrimination has been, has been violated because they unfairly face harm because of where they live. The case will likely go to trial sometime in 2015. And at trial, Ecojustice will have to demonstrate that their client's Section 7 right has been breached. So what does Section 7 say? Uh, it states that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person <clears throat> and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So first, equal justice must demonstrate on behalf of their clients that the harm has occurred, thus engaging their client's Section 7 right. Section 7 has been applied widely. Uh, cases of child protection, extradition, prostitution, safe drug injection sites, and abortion. If a law or a government decision increases health risks or compromises a person's dignity, personal autonomy, or their privacy, then it potentially violates that person's Section 7 right. In this case, in addition to health, it may be arguable that the claimant's dignity and personal autonomy have also been affected to the point of engaging their Section 7 rights, given uh, the choice they face of leaving their reserves or remaining in suffering health impacts. 
Perhaps most, more challengingly, eco-justice must also, also show that the harm was caused by the increased pollutants in the air and proving a causal relationship between environmental toxics and health impacts in specific individuals can be an uphill battle. Further, some might suggest that the complainants have the choice to simply move away from the harm and therefore they have basically accepted the risk to their health, essentially being the cause of their own misfortune. On the other hand, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized in the Canada v. Bradford case that in some instances, people may theoretically have the choice to avoid harm, but practically speaking, they do not. Liberty, as the Supreme Court of Canada explained, can include freedom to make choices that are fundamental or inherently personal, uh, personal to the individual. Such may well be the case with the residents of Sarnia, facing the decision to move away from their reserves and their communities in order to protect their health. Is that a real choice? Finally, eco-justice must establish on their client's behalf that the breach is not in concordance with the principles of fundamental justice, as per the second part of Section 7. Principles of fundamental justice have evolved since the Charter came into being. Once they were perhaps restricted to procedural aspects of justice, but are now described more broadly as simply principles that reflect our basic values as Canadians. And more specifically, the Supreme Court of Canada has identified arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality as contrary to notions of fundamental justice. I won't touch on arbitrariness or overbreadth, but a few words on disproportionality. To assess disproportionality, we ask one, whether there is a legitimate state interest, and two, whether the impacts of the law are grossly disproportionate to the state interest. As the Supreme Court of Canada held in Malmo Levine in 2003, the court has the authority <clears throat> to review the efficacy of the means enacted to achieve a legislative objective. In other words, we ask, is the law a too extreme response to the state interest? In Canada, the PHS Community Service Society, also known as the Insight case, and also a judicial review case, the Supreme Court of Canada held that the effect of the minister's decision, that is, the health impacts on addicts, was grossly disproportionate to the state's interest in prohibiting illegal drug possession. We can ask, in the Sarnia situation, whether the state's interest in allowing increased levels of pollution are grossly outweighed by the alleged impact on the claimant's health. Now, Section 7 has been used to address some of the more contentious social issues in Canada. Abortion, drug use, prostitution, assisted suicide, perhaps toxic pollutants will be next. Questions remain, however, even if the Sarnia case is successful. A charter-based right to a healthy environment is effective only against, uh, only against governments, not private polluters, unless, as in the Sarnia case, the industry and the environmental harm in question are regulated by the government. A charter-based right, also, would be left to the definition and interpretation of the courts, <clears throat> and who is to say how a court might choose to limit environmental rights, uh, even if it recognizes the right in part. Environmental rights can mean different things to, to different people. As well, a charter right is only invoked when someone directly suffers a breach of her or his right. A charter right would provide no broader legal option, such as through precautionary measures, to ensure a healthy environment. Furthermore, it's difficult to say how procedural environmental rights would come into existence through a charter-based environmental right. A recognized implicit right to a healthy environment in the Charter would be a strong and fundamental assertion of a substantive environmental right, but would not include articulated procedural environmental rights, which arguably are just as crucial. In an ideal Canada, perhaps we would create provincial and federal bills of environmental rights that would provide substantive environmental rights and articulate procedural rights combined with a substantive environmental right recognized in the Charter under Section 7. 
The road ahead to constitutional environmental rights in Canada is likely long, but there have been steps towards this goal. Several municipalities in Canada have now made declarations supporting environmental rights. Efforts are under way to achieve environmental rights in several provinces. And in 2011, MP Linda Duncan introduced a federal environmental bill of rights that had full support of the opposition parties. And perhaps with an upcoming change in the federal government, we'll see another uh, environmental bill of rights introduced. And um, I think it's entirely possible that law students, not too many years in the future, will look back and wonder at how in 2015, Canada still did not recognize its citizens' uh, legal right to clean air, water, land, and healthy food. So thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed this, this uh, presentation on environmental rights.